Would you open your Bibles with me today to 1 Corinthians chapter 7? 1 Corinthians 7, as we continue to uh, work through this uh, sermon series in 1 Corinthians today, we're going to look at verses 6 through verse 9. You'll notice uh, that you'll find it up on the screens above you, uh, in front of you, and you can read it there. But also, if you, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to have them open so you can look at the verses in more detail as I talk about them. And if you don't have a Bible and you want to find one, they're in the pew racks in front of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 6, and I'll read down through verse 9. Paul says, Now is a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has its own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And this is God's word. Now, we just read the passage, and one of the things that's probably clear from reading the passage is that this sermon is going to be on the single life or being single. But I want to begin the sermon today uh, by actually giving you a criticism or a critique of, of marriage. Now, that sounded crazy. It's because I didn't quite say it right. I'm not going to criticize marriage or critique marriage. I'm going to criticize and critique, I think, our wrong and distorted ways of thinking about marriage. And to be honest with you, are often, I, I, I can only say it this way, idolized views of marriage. And, and what I mean by that is that we within the church of God at times can so elevate marriage, can put it up to such a high place that we actually end up treating it as if it is this sort of ideal status that all people have to reach. And that if you, if you don't reach that, then you haven't you know, you haven't gotten something, you're not, you can't be fully Christian, if you will, if you, if you haven't reached that point. I know we won't say it like that, but I, I wonder at times whether that's the way we think about marriage. And so if you want to be a really good Christian, then you need to get married. And if you want to be a really, really good Christian, you need to have a couple of babies so you can have babies running around too. And I think we got that baby thing going on. So we got a bunch of good Christians here. Now, as I criticize that what I would consider faulty thinking about marriage, let me, let me also say that in no way am I attempting to denigrate marriage in terms of the importance of marriage. It is a good gift. We had a wedding here yesterday, and one of the things I'll say in all weddings is that, that, that marriage is, is God-ordained. It's something that God has given for the good of all mankind, and certainly as, as believers in Christ, as Shelby even prayed today, Marriage has these wonderfully profound realities to it, not only companionship and relationship and fellowship and sanctification, is a, I think is a tool, a significant tool of sanctification, but it's also a picture for us of, of Christ's relationship to the church. So in no way am I attempting to denigrate marriage when I critique our views of marriage. But at the same time, I want you to hear me say this. Marriage is not ultimate. Let me say that again. Marriage is not ultimate ultimate. Okay? When it all has come down to it, God alone is ultimate. God alone is the one who is to ultimately be glorified with all of our lives. And so if some of us have said that when we think about marriage and singleness, we need to think about marriage and singleness as being penultimate or secondary. They, they point us to the one who is ultimate. And you and I, I think it's really important that we understand that. Because when we don't, we don't get that right, which I think a lot of evangelical churches don't get that right. We end up placing single people in, in I think, a, an incredibly difficult position. They, they, they have a hard time understanding just how wonderful it is to be single and all that can be there in being single. And, and we end up creating this posture in which single people end up thinking that where they are in life is somehow aberrant and to be quickly remedied by marriage. See? That singleness is an, an aberrant position to be in. And you have to just as quickly as possible get past it to get married. And so, you know, we do the matchmaking thing. So, you know, if you think about how churches handle singleness, matchmake. And I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, I, I've done it a time or two myself. <laughs> Especially if it's desire. 
But this idea that somehow being single is an aberrant place to be, I just don't think the Bible teaches that. And certainly Paul doesn't teach that in this particular passage. In fact, as we look at it, I think he wants Christians to experience their singleness as something that is good. And we're going to, we're going to talk about that. It's going to be the first thing I talk to you about from this passage. That Paul wants Christian people to experience their singleness as a good thing. If you look at verse 8, I think this is what he's getting at here. It says, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Now, one of the things I want you to just first of all get, which I think it's, it's really when you, when you wrap your mind around this, I think this is just, I don't know, it's just cool. And it's this. Here is one of the explicit places where Paul actually says, what state was he in? He was single. And he's actually saying that he wishes that you would remain single as he is. Now, scholars debate, and they go back and forth. We, we don't really know the answers to this. Scholars debate whether Paul was always single or whether Paul at one time had a, a wife. A, a lot of scholars, and this is, this is probably where I would land on this. I mean, it's debatable. But a lot of scholars actually believe that Paul was at one time married. And the reason for that is because of the nature of the culture that he lived in and the fact that he was a Jewish Pharisee and the significance of Jewish men being married. So many think that Paul at one time was married and, and his wife passed away. And so he was a, a widower. Okay. Regardless of that, I want you to just rest in for a moment with me this reality that Paul was single. Push that back a little bit. It's not just that Paul was single. Jesus was single. And he was never married. Jesus was single. And so then when we think about our, our Savior, and what probably, because we're all Presbyterians, so we got a real high view of Paul, right? Like the chief theologian, Paul, was single. I think that says something. But notice again the text. It is good. Notice what he's saying. It is good for them to remain single as I am. Now, don't, don't misunderstand this. Paul is not in saying that, that singleness and remaining single is a good thing. Paul is not saying that being married is a bad thing. So don't translate it into that. Nor is Paul saying that a desire to be married is a bad thing. He's not saying that either. But he is saying something I think incredibly important for us to recognize about the single life. That it is being single, remaining single, is a good thing to the Apostle Paul. Now, notice he addresses in verse 8, and I want to explore this a little bit with you. He addresses in verse 8, or, or addresses this to the unmarried and, and the widows. Now, typically when we read that, especially you're just reading the English version, when you read the unmarried, what you think that Paul is, is talking about, it, and this makes sense, is every category of being unmarried. And, and it could, could touch into that, but, but many scholars actually point out that the, the word that he uses here is a word that can actually mean a bachelor or a widower. Now, some have even gone to the point of saying that what Paul may be doing here, because he kind of bounces back and forth from talking to men to women, is what Paul is actually doing, if I were to paraphrase it, is he is addressing this to the widowers and to widows. I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Now, I, I want to point that out to you, not to, not to pull away from the application of this passage to all singles, regardless of where you may find yourself as a single adult. But I say that to you because it's, it's interesting that if Paul is writing here to widowers and to widows, to people who had spouses at one time, but their spouses had passed away and now they were single, it forces us to recognize something. He's dealing with a writing to people who aren't necessarily saying my preference is to be single. He's writing to people who are finding themselves in the circumstances of being single. And I think that's important. 
If you're, if you're here today, regardless as to where you may be as a single adult, it may be you're a single adult and you've never been married. It may be you are a single adult and, and your spouse passed away, so you're a widow or a widower. It may be that you are a single adult and, and you've gone through a divorce and, and you have biblical grounds to remarry. You may be a single person in all those categories. And I think this situation that Paul is describing kind of fits you because in some ways you are at this place where your circumstances, God by his his sovereignty has you in this circumstance right now in which you are a single person. You may have every longing and desire to get married, but right now, based upon God's sovereign design in your life, you are a single person. Being there, hear what Paul says to you. That is actually, hear it like this, that is a good place to be. It's not a bad place to be. It's a good place to be. Now, I, I know, I mean, because I've been there. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to, to, come, to be in a church where, I mean, we have a, we have a good number of singles, especially this service, more than, than usual. But, but yeah, I mean, to be in a church where you're looking around, there's all these married people and all these little children running around and you, you want to get there, you want to be there, and you can't wait to get there, and all those kind of things. And they, you need to hear this. You need to hear what Paul is saying. Right now, where you are as a single man and a single woman, that is a good thing. It's not deficient. It's not inadequate. It's not something that you have to correct because it's wrong. See? And I think that's important. Significant and important for you to get. See, the singleness isn't something you just want to just move past to get a husband or wife. Paul's calling you to recognize right here and right now that this is this is a good thing. We make a mistake as churches when we when we ever create an atmosphere where our single people feel like they are second class citizens. The Bible just doesn't allow that to happen, and Paul doesn't. Now to take it a step further. Let's move past that. I think Paul wants, as, you, as we look at the passage further, the Christians who are single to actually exercise their singleness as a gift. And so if, if Paul, one thing Paul is saying, I think very clearly, is that Christians should experience their singleness as a good thing. But I also think Paul is saying that Christians need to exercise their singleness as a gift to others. Now, where do I get that? Well, if you, if you notice the text again, you look at verse 7. Here's what it says, and I'm going to tell you how we normally read this, but I'm going to tell you what I think Paul is actually getting at. In verse 7, we'll, we'll read, read, let's read the verse. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and, and one of another. Now, when that, that says right there that each has his own gift from God, here's what we normally do with that. We'll normally read, each has his own gift from God, and we will think that what Paul is saying is that that particular gift is the gift of celibacy. And when we think about what celibacy is, here's what we will translate it. Instead of celibacy just simply being abstaining from, we'll view celibacy as this, some kind of, of supernatural thing, a supernatural in, enablement by which you no longer struggle with or have these sort of sexual longings or desires for marriage. And so those things have been removed. And as a result of that, how many of us who are married couples here and how many single people who are here are going, I got to get married because I don't have that gift of celibacy. You know you said it. You know you did. Right? And even if you can get to the point, I mean, maybe it is true. I don't know. Some scholars think this. Some scholars think that there is a gift of celibacy, that, you, that all of that kind of happens. So you don't, you don't get all stressed out over, over having sex or wanting to have sex or anything like that. It's just not there for you. You're, you're all cool and stress-free about all of that. We can acknowledge that. And I can also say that probably ain't you. <laughs> and so then we, we look at this and I think we lose some of its power. Some of what Paul is trying to get at in terms of, of, of helping you as a single person in your singleness right now to recognize that you in your singleness right now can truly be a gift to the church of God. And I think that's what he's, what he's doing. 
He's driving us to see it that way. I wish when he when he says, I wish that all were as I myself am. My, my question, and I don't think this is what he's saying, is that, that that means he wishes everybody were celibate as he were, somehow supernaturally. And this is especially the case if it is true, which it probably is, that Paul at one time was married. And Paul now is single. And now Paul, I think the point of this is he sees the situation, the circumstance that he finds himself in at this very moment as being what? As being an opportunity to be a gift to others, a gift to the church, a gift to the advancement of the kingdom of God. And I, I honestly do believe that our default mode, our default posture in the church is to view singleness as something that you just have to get past. We, we, we do that so often and so easily and so quickly that we don't recognize all that the Bible says that is important about being single because you got to get them married. And Paul is saying just the opposite of that. He said, in fact, I think it's good if you remain single. And he fully well recognizes that a lot of people won't. But he certainly sees this as a good. You know, Tim Keller writes about this, and he writes specifically about this passage. And he, he does it in, in his book on marriage, The Meaning of Marriage, and he has a chapter dealing with the single life. And by the way, recommend that book, recommend that book. If, if for married couples and for single people, it's just a fantastic book on marriage. But anyway, he makes this statement, and I think he's right. He says in, in his writings, Paul always uses the word gift to mean an ability God gives to build up others. Notice that. That this is what a gift is. It's, it's for the edification of the church, the building up the church. It's not something you just sort of take away something, right? So Paul is not speaking then of some kind of elusive, stress-free state. The giftness of being single for Paul lay in the freedom it gave him to concentrate on ministry in ways that a married man could not. Paul's singleness is a gift because it enabled him to focus on ministry in a way that a married man could not, to give his time, to give his energy fully to the work of ministry in a very different way because he's a single person. Now, if, if we, you begin to think about the giftedness of singleness like that, as opposed to just just sort of a, a, a celibacy that means you're removed from, from all sexual interest, right? Then you can begin to recognize that what Paul is saying here about singleness, it applies to way more of, of, in fact, I would say that what Paul is saying about singleness applies to every single, single person here who professes faith in Jesus Christ. It may be that you're single for a short time. It may be that you're looking for a spouse. It may be that you're single for an extended period of time. It could be any number of situations, but what I'm telling you, and, and I want you to press into this, that where you are right now, that's a good thing, and you should treat it as a gift to us. That you should, you should be about God's business in the midst of that. And, and be about God's business in the midst of your singleness right now in a way that maybe you won't have all the time to be about God's business when you, when you do get married and start popping out little children. But don't we work differently than that? I mean, how many times, I, I've seen this in our very denomination, how, how many times can men not find pastoral calls because they're not married? I remember when I lived in Miami. I, I, I was in a, before I started pastoring in Miami, I was a part of a large PCA church there. And we had, we actually called a young man who was a, a single minister in the church. He got married while we were there, but he was a single man when he got called. And I remember he was, we were close in age and the times how much it was so difficult for him because of the way that he was, he was viewed even in the role. I mean, in the life of Redeemer, we've had an intern at Redeemer who is a single man who struggled to find a call. He finally got one, but who struggled to find a call, and he was actually told over and over again that part of it was the fact that he was single. Now, I'll say something absurd to you. I want you to hear all the absurdity of it. I think in some of our churches, the Paul we love to read, 
couldn't be the pastor in our churches. See? But we just have this tendency to do this over and over, and I, I know what it feels like. I, I, I get it. I get it. And then we'll back off and we'll justify like this. Well, you know, you got to be careful with sexual sin, with single people, sexual sin. Yeah, you do. You want to know something else? You got to be careful with sexual sin with married people. You hear me? We're to be concerned about sexual sin. I think Paul is saying that singleness is good. We need to hear that. Singleness needs to be treated as a gift. We need to hear that. But please realize, and I'm going to lead into this last point by saying this, that Paul only encourages an ongoing life of singleness with godliness. So so listen to what what I think he's saying. On the one hand, I think what Paul is is saying is that that Christians experience your singleness as a good thing. Don't back away from that. Embrace it. Exercise your singleness as a gift to others. But only continue in it, right? He encourages we only continue in it with godliness as our mindset. And I think this is what he's getting at in verse 9. Verse 9, but, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, something I've said to you already is that I think in the church we can have a, a very high view, rightfully so, high view of marriage. We make a mistake when that high view of marriage translates into an idolatrous view of marriage. Okay, that's the church. Everybody has to be married. Everybody has to be, you know, that kind of thinking. All right, that's the thinking that can be in the church. I think in Paul's day, that was the kind of thinking that was in the culture that pushed into the church. But today, I don't think a high view of marriage is, is, is a part of our culture. It's just not, right? I, I think a, a really high, exalted view of marriage is true in the church in the culture, I think what we end up finding is, is that what's, what has, takes on precedent to people is self-fulfillment. That's it. So if being married fulfills you, do it. If being in a homosexual relationship fulfills you, do it. If being single forever, meaning a preference for singleness, if that fulfills you, then do it. Now here's what this looks like. Paul, on the one hand, I think probably is speaking of a preference for his own single life. I think he, he's saying remain in this because he's remaining in it, right? He had a preference for, for being single. But you want to know something? His preference for being single was kingdom oriented. He, he had a preference for being single because he wanted to be about God's glory. He wanted to be able to have all of this energy to do these things for the kingdom of God that God had called him to. That's a preference for singles. Now, when you talk about our culture today, and people in our culture today who speak of a preference for singleness, eh, not for God's glory, it's because what? I got to hold off getting married because I got to get my career established. I got to hold off for getting married because I want to travel the world. Or I got to hold off getting married because I just want to be unattached and free. And loose. Okay. Now, here's a question I think Paul will ask. If, 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 I'm, if I'm standing here as a minister of the gospel and I'm trying to speak Paul's words, here's what I, would, what, what I think Paul would ask you right now, if that's the posture you're in. There's this sort of preference of being single to do those things that you want to do. Here's the question. Are you being Sexually pure. Are you being sexually pure? Or are you in your attempt to hold off attachment to someone else so that you can have all of these things that you want and desire, all of that, in the midst of holding off marriage into your 30s or 40s, and you're intentionally, you're going, I I have a preference for singleness because I want to accomplish all of these things. In the midst of all of that, are you at the same time hooking up or shacking up or every other wrong kind of up? 
How are you living your life? And to that, Paul speaks. He says, that's where you are. If, if, I mean, if you look at the text again, verse 9, notice, notice what he says. If, if you cannot exercise self-control, what he's getting at is if, if, if you're not able to control that longing and desires for, for having sexual intimacy, then that may be where you are. Then what? You should get married. In that regard, I would jump right into matchmaking. I think it's a good thing. Let's do it. Let's match them up. Let's get them hooked up. Let's get them married to each other. I think. But this is what he's, this is what he's driving at. You see? That this is the right place. Now, let me, let me back up and let me say some, something else to you. A lot of times when people have looked at what Paul says here, that if you cannot control your, yourselves, then you need to get married and burn, all that kind of thing. A lot of people think that what Paul's doing is he's giving to, and let me be specific, men, the remedy for lust. Dude. No. That's just like bogus wrong, ridiculous stupid. And if you've been married for any period of time, you know, I mean, Paul isn't saying for you, man, lustful single man, the way that I deal with my lust is to get married. No, here's the issue. You are going to battle against sexual sin and temptation and lust as a single person, and you're going to battle against sexual temptation and lust as a married person. You battle this throughout life. Paul isn't giving the remedy, the solution to lust. What he's saying is, if you can't control your longings for having sexual intimacy, then the God-ordained, divinely sanctioned place for having a sexual relationship is within marriage. Mark Dever is a pastor of a church in the D.C. area. And he did this conference that John Piper, Lloyd, turned me on to this. Um, it's called Sex and the Supremacy of God, and it was published in this book, and he wrote this article it's called Sex and the Single Man. And he says in there, and I want to read this to you because it's just so flat out blunt and in your face. And, and I, I guess when you talk about this stuff, you need to be. He said this, and this would be equally true for women. Mark Dever, quote, the first thing <laughs> to say about sex and the single man, or the first thing to say about sex and the single woman, is there should be none. There should be none. God has given us a place for this, and it is marriage. It's marriage. All other places for this ultimately are harmful and destructive and sinful. And so as a single person, what he's saying is, in many ways, I could, I could put it like this, if I were to kind of wrap up a bunch of things he's saying. In many ways, what he's saying to us is, hey, marriage is good. Not ultimate, good. Good. Being single is good. Sexual sin, whether you are single or married, is not. Because ultimately, what he wants from us is what? Godliness. Godliness. For single people, for married people. Godliness. And what this leads us to is this. This is a reason why the answer to lust isn't just getting married. It's because our hearts have to be reoriented. Our desires have to be reoriented around what's beautiful and good around our God. You see, that's what Paul wants. Christians should experience their singleness as good, experience it and, and exercise their singleness as a gift, but to hold it with godliness. Let's pray together.
Father, we are thankful for this time in your word today, and we just pray for your help in applying it. Lord, I know there are a lot of single people here and um, at different places, and, and some, Lord, have probably found a, a real peace in this life, and I, I want to thank you for that. Continue to give them that. Others are struggling this, Lord, and I just pray you would help them in the specific way they need to be helped, whatever that may be. Uh, some, Lord, are praying for a spouse, and I just pray that as well, that you would bless uh, folks with that. But Lord, guard us and help us all, um, married or single, to have a, a Lord, a, a, a bright understanding of the, the wondrous uh, ways that you have designed us uh, for intimacy with one person that we've bound ourselves to in commitment and trust for life. Help us to see that, Lord, as beautiful as you see that against a world that doesn't. Help us to be driven, Lord, more by your glory and your desires than we're driven by our own self-centeredness and selfishness. Lord, this is about you, ultimately, and I pray that that's what we would long for in our own lives and in this church. In Christ's name, amen.